Hello, and welcome to Behind the Politics, a weekly podcast where we interview members of the Colorado State Senate Democratic Caucus to learn more about their personal and political lives. My name is David. I'm the Communications Director for the Caucus, and I'm here with my colleague, Jill. Hi. Our Civic Engagement Director. Today, we are finally interviewing. State Senator Dominic Moreno, who isn't busy at all. Uh, <laughs> hi, Senator Moreno, and thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And now that the budget's closed, you know, I, I am looking for things to do, so I'm glad this finally fit in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Senator Moreno represents northern parts of Metro Denver. He was elected to the Senate in 2016 after serving in the House for four years. He's currently the youngest member of the Senate Democratic Caucus, and he sits on the Joint Budget and Appropriations Committees. So, since you are our token JVC member, we have to ask you a couple questions about the state budget. Um, so, you know, as far as I understand it, the JVC has a really steep learning curve. You begin in November, soon after being appointed, essentially, um, and then, you know, you dive right into these really complicated budgetary situations. So, to you, what has been the most difficult part about essentially starting this job up in November? So, I think one of the fondest memories I have, maybe not fond, but Um, It was when I was elected by our caucus to uh, represent um, our interests on the JBC. And uh, immediately after getting elected, I was handed two huge binders um, of things to read and to get acquainted with. Um, And, uh, you know, actually Vic Vela from CPR, like, took a picture because he thought it was hilarious that it's the only position where as soon as you get elected, you're handed all this information expected to master it the next day. Um, So I think that's been a a challenge, is just the level of mastery that you have, um, that you're expected to have over a variety of different state departments and state budgets. And, um, you know, the JBC has complete oversight over every single department in the state of Colorado. So everything from water to, you know, uh, child care and and, uh, schools, you are expected to know the ins and outs of all of those programs. Um, It's a lot to absorb uh, for one person. Um, And so what you end up seeing actually on the JBC is uh, people uh, kind of cornering out different uh, areas in the state budget to become experts in. Uh, And so you have, you know, for example, Representative Dave Young, who is an expert in uh, intellectual and developmental disability issues. You have Millie Hamner, who is an expert in school finance. Um, you have Bob Rankin, who's an expert in severance tax. I'm still trying to figure out what my area of expertise might be. I'm looking at maybe higher education because there are such um, huge issues there and affordability for families. So I would love to do more on that and really make sure that, uh, you know, maybe Medicaid will be another area of expertise for me, uh, particularly making sure that uh, folks who are vulnerable, who are low income or have disabilities or, uh, you know, uh, have diabetes and need um, procedures there, that those folks are all taken care of. And we are facing some huge issues with the federal government and Medicaid right now. Uh, my hope is that we will be able to pick up, pick up the slack in Colorado, uh, that the federal government doesn't decimate a really important program like Medicaid by reducing their financial commitment and responsibility to that program. Because if they do that, then we're going to have some really tough choices to make in Colorado. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a perfect segue into my, my next question. With um, the Senate considering the budget this week, um, what most concerns you about the current budget? So I think what's most concerning for me is beyond some of those federal issues that I talked about, right? Because the federal government is making a variety of changes to the federal bu- budget that will ultimately affect us at the state level. That's concerning. But what's more concerning to me is actually what we've done ourselves to our state budget to lock us into a certain way of doing things. And that usually has to do with the constitutional amendments that voters have passed. Everything from the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, TABOR, which limits the ability of state government to levy taxes. Uh, But beyond that, actually, the more insidious part of TABOR is actually establishing a cap on how much government can grow by each year and establishing that cap at the very bare minimum of what most people would expect in government services. Um, So that's a huge challenge. Uh, Amendment 23, which very well intentioned, meant for us to increase support for education, uh, but has only uh, resulted in more pressure being 
placed on the state budget and us having to make some really difficult conversations and as uh, or difficult decisions. And as a result of that, now education comprising the, the vast share of our state budget. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the, the Gallagher Amendment, which is something that we're finally seeing uh, come into play um, this budget year. Uh, the last time Gallagher was in play was way back in 2003. Most people have forgotten that it can have a devastating impact on the state budget. We are out of balance again for property taxes between residential sources and commercial sources. And what Gallagher requires us to do when that happens is to lower uh, property tax. And if you think about the entities that depend most on property tax, their fire districts, their water districts, uh, their schools, uh, their cities and counties and parks and recreation districts, these people are all facing huge cuts in their budget for next year. And it's actually schools that uh, the state legislature is the only entity that we have the ability to make up that difference for. Uh, those other fire districts, water districts, parks di districts, all those folks are just going to lose money and we can't do anything about it at the state capitol. Uh, for schools, that's a different story. But this is a huge challenge that we're facing for next year, and it's resulting in us having to find another, um, you know, over $150 million in our budget uh, to put towards schools because they're going to lose that in local property tax revenue. And uh, just to kind of, uh, in addition to that, I know that one part uh, that has been talked about a lot, uh, especially in uh, more, more, the more rural areas in Colorado, has been uh, the rural hospitals. I, from what I understand, uh, could you go into a little bit of that, uh, about how the rural hospitals could be potentially hurt by this budget? Yeah, so uh, we made some really tough choices on the Joint Budget Committee this year, and a, a cut to rural hospitals is one of them. Uh, rural hospitals, as a result of our budget, are facing... Um, a cut of about half a billion dollars next year. And that's because, um, you know, the, the $264 million that we are actually forced to send back to taxpayers uh, pursuant to Tabor, uh, we decided that instead we would restrict the level of revenue that we're bringing in so that we don't face that. So that $264 million doesn't have to come from schools and doesn't have to come from roads and all these very important government services. Um, and so what we did was we reduced the hospital provider fee by $264 million. The hospital provider fee is a fee that hospitals pay, they willingly give to the state so that we can match that with federal dollars and that they can be able to serve uh, low-income individuals and people who show up that don't aren't actually insured. Uh, this is all you know money that they use to do that. Um, and as a result of, um, you know, the, the situation that we're in, we had to restrict that revenue by $264 million, which doubles its impact when you think about the federal match that they would otherwise qualify for. So this, I think, if we can't do something on hospital provider fee and making an enterprise or doing something, um, I think we will see rural hospitals close. And we will see entities like Denver Health, uh, which is a safety net hospital, which is where they will serve everyone, no matter... Uh, your ability to pay, they are going to face a huge cut as well. Um, and they are going to have to limit the care that they provide to people. This is a huge challenge. And I'm, it's one of the reasons that I'm really hopeful that we will be able to get to a deal on hospital provider fee this session. Well, uh, you know, thank you for all that, Senator. That's all really, uh, I know there's a lot of folks out there who don't really understand just the uh, what goes into creating our state budget uh, that we are constitutionally the, the Senate and the General Assembly in general is constitutionally required to pass by this budget every year um, so switching gears a little bit uh, let's chat a little bit about your background and your career path you were born and raised in Adams County I believe you're a native son there and uh, what made you want to get involved in politics tell us a little bit about your background and you know what led you to being here sure right? Uh, so, uh, I was born and raised in Adams County. I actually live only a block away from the house I grew up in and where my parents still live. Super convenient if you're um, still a bachelor like I am. Uh, you can go home for home-cooked meals all the time. Um, but, um, you know, I, uh, I grew up in that community and um, I was really fortunate. I got a great scholarship, the Daniels Fund Scholarship, and I was able to take that and go to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Um, and while there, you know, I very much took to the Jesuit mission 
of social justice, uh, of um, contributing back in some small way. And so uh, in addition to, you know, I didn't have the traditional profile of a, of a kid that goes to Georgetown. Um, I had to work to put myself through college. Um, but I also found time to do community service. And I um, did after-school programs in, um, in uh, Southeast D.C. elementary schools, um, and packaged meals for people with terminal illnesses. Um, all of those different service projects really provided me a meaningful experience in college. Um, my problem was I had horrible timing. I graduated in 2008, the height of the recession, and um, you know there were no jobs. And uh, so I ended up moving back uh, home and into my parents' basement, like every college graduate those days. Um, and that's when I randomly got a Facebook message from a friend I went to high school with. And she said, you know, there are seats up on the city council and I think you should run. And my immediate thought was, I don't know of anyone that's going to vote for a 24 year old who lives in his parents' basement. I don't think that's going to happen. And I had no idea how to run a political campaign. And, uh, but I thought about it more and I was like, you know what? The success that I've had in my life to date is not my own. Um, it came from, the people in the community that supported me, my teachers, my parents. And why not use this amazing education I was able to get um, right at home? And so I decided to run for city council uh, at 24, living in my parents' basement. Uh, I had, you know, I ended up designing my own flyer on Microsoft Word. Um, I made copies at Kinko's, black and white, because I couldn't afford color. Um, And that's what I handed out to people. Um, And... Um, universally, uh, people said the same thing. Uh, you don't have the most experience, but we know you, and you grew up here, and we admire that uh, you, in a small way, are trying to pay back everything that you were given growing up. Um, and uh, by the time I jumped in, two other people had already announced. Um, I didn't think I had any shot whatsoever. And um, election day came around, and um, I actually ended up getting more votes than the other two people combined. Um, and became the youngest person ever elected in Commerce City history. And when that happens, all you can think is, crap, what do I do now? Because I never expected to win. Um, But I uh, got up to speed on the issues very quickly, um, loved every minute of serving on a city council. That is where um, government meets, the rubber meets the road there. You talk to people every day, um, you know, they call you if their trash doesn't get picked up. They call you if um, they have a, a, a neighbor's barking dog that, you know, just won't, just keeping them awake. Um, it's all those very small issues, uh, but really important in, in people's lives. And so I loved that direct contact that I was able to have with folks. Um, and then a seat opened up in uh, the state house, and I thought about all the things that I went to school for civil rights, education, health care. Um, and those are the issues that are debated here down at the state capitol. And I wanted to have um, some influence and involvement in those issues. And so I decided to run for the state house and serve there for four years and um, now find myself in the state senate. And uh, has it's been great. And so finally, just a fun question that we're going to ask all of our guests. What is the most embarrassing thing that has happened to you at the capitol? So I had to give this some thought, but it's actually um, an embarrassing thing that happened just today that my uh, legislative aide can also attest to. Uh, We were hosting students from uh, Mesa Elementary uh, here at the state capitol today. And, uh, you know, we kind of let them run wild in one of the Senate committee rooms. They're like, oh, yeah, sit in the senator's seats, take some photos, have a good time. Um, Well, it turns out in, in some of that ensuing chaos that was there with these elementary school kids, Um, someone found the panic button and pressed it. Um, So State Patrol came to the uh, Senate committee room, and it was after they had left, Uh, but I... um, The sergeants had told me that someone had pressed the panic button, and I had to... I stayed back uh, to apologize to State Patrol and let them know that there were these kids that were having a good time in the Senate committee rooms, and I didn't even know there was a panic button, but apparently there was, and someone pushed it. Uh, but they were very understanding, um, and so uh, that was that was pretty embarrassing today. But 
That might be one of the best ones that I've heard since we've started doing this show. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking to us, uh, Senator Moreno, finally, or being able to fit us into your busy schedule. And uh, thank you at home for listening. We'll be back next week with State Senator Rhonda Fields. Thanks so much for listening.